Giles' article so um, on my radio program. And when I use the word debate, I was just meaning that I was debating him myself on the radio. Gotcha. I, yeah, I, never, I never had him on debating him. Yeah, um, that's what I was. I was curious because, you know, he and I, um, <laughs> I don't know if you, he and I do a podcast together. Okay. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to make sure we are, uh, we are live here now, Frank. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to make sure that the audio is working here. On my radio program. And when I use the word debate, I would. Perfect. Just... All right. Yeah, everything seems to go uh, be working. So, um, hey, everyone, uh, we'll, we'll be starting in just a second here. We will wait for a couple people to show up and watch this lively discussion on universalism or universal reconciliation, however you want to define it, Frank. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've heard restoration, reconciliation. I've heard a couple of various terms, but I just call it universalism. That works for me. Um, all right, cool. So we're, we're going here on Facebook. I've got the window closed. Uh, hopefully people don't ping me too often here. Sometimes it gets a little out of control. So um, uh, Frank Holzhauser, did I get that right? Perfect. Perfect. All right. See Now, you know. hey, pronounce your last name. Well, it's DiStefano. DiStefano, that's what I was. And you go by Matthew or... Well, yeah, I, when I started writing books, I, I decided to go with the Matthew. It sounds more official and legit. Right. And I put the J in there for some reason. I don't know why, but Matt is fine. Are you you're okay with Matt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I thought it would be, um, Frank had reached out, sent a message to me um, about an article I wrote. I don't know which one. I guess it doesn't matter at this point. Um, and we we're talking and thought it would be an interesting time to discuss universalism. And um, of course we, we need to define what that means because it can mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. But before we do that, Frank, why don't you tell people who you are, what you do? Um, yeah, um, it looks like you're in a studio there. Yeah, I do radio here every day, two hours a day, four to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, Des Moines, West Des Moines, Iowa, actually. Um, I'm. Um, 63-year-old Seventh-day Adventist, uh, cradle, cradle Adventist. I'm about as smart, I guess, as any lay person you're going to find. I'm not educated in the seminary. I'm not a theological, or, a stu or not theological, but I'm not a seminary student, theology student. I'm just a lay person. I am an ordained deacon, but I think you'll find me as about as engaging and knowledgeable as most lay people you'll speak to. So I hope we have a kind of a lively conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And people on my timeline know who I am, so I won't bore them with the details. But let's before we before we um, hear from you and your thoughts on universalism, I want to make sure that we don't talk past one another and we um, define what that means. And so um, for the for the purpose of our discussion, um, let's focus on Christian universalism or patristic universalism, or if you want to call it biblical universalism. Some people might take uh, umbrage with that, but um, rather than a more pluralistic universalism. So it'll be focused on Christian theology rather than, um, you know, like I said, more pluralistic universalist, uh, where you could be agnostic about how the universalism works and maybe it's not Christian, maybe it's otherwise, but we'll stick with Christian universalism. Basically the belief that through Christ or the cross and the resurrection, um, very Jesus centered that all will be redeemed or reconciled and that if there is a hell, it's not eternal. And um, I mean, that's kind of a loose definition, right? Do, does that include Satan? Well, um, without getting too sidetracked, it depends on what you mean by Satan. Well, would God ultimately uh, save Satan and his evil, uh, Satan and his fallen angels? It depends. Well, I mean, so, so you're kind of presupposing that there is a Satan with an ontology and you, I mean, you're using a pronoun of his meaning um, that there is an actual entity or an ontological being called Satan. Um, 
And I, I don't know if we want to go down that route necessarily, okay. because I don't know if I, aff- I, I don't, I don't personally affirm that premise. I do okay. believe Satan as in a, an office or a role, but I don't think that there is like a creature called Satan. Okay. So that well, might get us, that, got, that might get us a little sidetracked, but, but yes, in the, um, I, I believe like origin and, um, Clement of Alexandria did include Satan in, in the redemption, in the redemption. Well, one of the things that I read early on when I started visiting the Pantheos website is one of the four, uh, it's one of the four or five Christian websites I use for my radio program. And I come across this article in, t- in July of 2019. It's written by a guy named Richard Murray. Yeah. Okay. He's a his blog and it's four reasons why the early church did not believe hell lasts forever. Okay. Well, as a seventh day Adventist, we teach uh, conditionalism. God's promises, or, or let's put it this way, God's love is unconditional, but his promises are not. And I would argue, I, I'll give you just my best shot right out of the gate, and then we can kind of go from there. I would just simply say that there is a lot of what I would consider false doctrines from the belief of eternal torment, universalism, sainthood, reincarnation, purgatory, and spiritualism. And they're all based on the very first lie in the Bible, that God says the day you eat of this tree, ye shall surely die. That's not an ambiguity statement to me. And Satan come along, or the serpent come along, and said, no, not only are you not going to die, but you will be as a God. So there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden that we partook of, Adam and Eve would have partook of, to their, their, eterni- their, their immortal life was based on obedience. Their eternity, it, eternal life was based on obedience. So if they're eating of that tree of life and not eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they live forever. But God said specifically, you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Now, some people will describe that as a spiritual death, and I would agree that they died spiritually. But had not a remedial animal sacrifice been immediately instituted, man would have had to have died. So I would simply argue that without the natural immortal soul, eternal torment, universalism, sainthood, reincarnation, purgatory, and spiritualism, they all fall under their own weight. So I don't necessarily have to disprove eternal torment or universalism as long as I can present to you that God alone is immortal. And if everything else is not immortal, then how can um, eternal torment exist? Because in essence, that would be almost a perverse eternal life. Well, okay, so if God, in your view... um you're saying that only God is immortal. So do you, or do you believe that all are annihilated, even believers, even yourself? Uh, or God, God imparts life to, to, to whom? God originally would have imparted life on Adam and Eve on the condition of obedience. That was basically the first covenant. Obey and live, disobey and die eat of this tree and live, eat of this tree and die. But now once they die, once they disobeyed, and God already had this in the planning because he knew in his foreknowledge their disobedience, he had a plan from the foundations of the world that he himself would come and die to live as the second Adam, the life that the first Adam couldn't or wouldn't live. Okay. And so his life is taken into account of our sinful life. If we accept that in faith, we can inherit eternal, eternal life, salvation, immortality. So, so that's, a, so it's upon, it's upon accept it's upon having faith. It's upon accepting Christ. Yes. It's it, so, so primary to, for our salvation is our choice or our decision. Yes, because that would lie at the very argument of uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism, which is an endless debate. 
but well, it's, imagine, it's, all, it's also it's also a straw man. But I'll, I'll let you continue. Well, I had a I had a principal in school, my first male principal, and when I was about fifth grade, we had, you know, he's getting kind of athletic in fifth grade, and um, you know, he would usually give a couple of the older eighth graders a chance to pick the teams, but they would always lopsided and pick the team. So what he ended up doing is he would put everybody in a line. And maybe he might rearrange a few people in line, but he'd go down the line. He'd say one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay. All the ones over here is one team. All the twos over here is the other team. That's the way I see predestination election. God somehow lining up the teams. One, two, you guys over here are lost. You guys over here are saved. And for the privilege of being hardwired to be malfunction, I've got this eternal bonfire stoking over here for an eternity to dump you in i mean that would chase anybody from god and it drives yeah, yeah. calvinism created an atheist in me for a time well so robert I, I see that yeah go ahead go ahead no i just i agree with you like calvinism well, robert, creates atheists all day robert and and they're over there standing in the water saying come on in the water's just fine <laughs> i mean you know right. robert ingersoll uh, was a had a fire and brimstone daddy, Presbyterian preacher that preached the love of God. But if you didn't love that God back, he was going to plunge you into torment. And Robert Ingersoll couldn't rectify those two gods. So rather than to believe in a vindictive, vengeful God that would do that, he just come up with the concept, no God. And I would kind of call him the father of modern day agnosticism. But, you know, um, well, okay, so a lot's been said. Um, I guess initially, I would I would say that what would what would be the difference between? So you're you're not teaching fire and brimstone, but there is a there is a quid pro quo of sorts, and and if I understand you correctly, someone who does not accept Christ as their savior or Lord, or however you want to put it, will be, will be destroyed, will be annihilated. And, and I, and I would, I would say, okay, that's better than eternal torment, but that's because eternal torment, the bar is so low. Well, I've got this really smart friend. He's an atheist. He comes from uh, a line of six generations of Presbyterian pastors or Protestant pastors. He was the, uh, he was the, head president of the ISU, Iowa State University's uh, Atheist Club. Guy is smarter than, I mean, he's got more Bibles than most Christians put together. Guy just loves Bibles, but he's an atheist. And he talks about the problem, you know, coming from the, that, that, that God would be immoral, absolutely immoral, if he chose man to fail and then burn him and punish him eternally because he failed. I agree. Okay, so right out the gate, that chases men and women into the arms of infidels all day. But the other problem that my friend would say, well, free will is problematic because that would put some force out there, and I would date this maybe back to Zoroastrianism and dualism, that somehow God and and evil or good and evil are competing forces that are co-eternal and they never end. Uh, I would say Satan's free will or Satan's will is inside of God's larger sovereign will that we all make decisions. We all make choices because my friend Chris John says, and he admitted to me or acknowledged to me one time that if he ever converted back to Christianity, and that's a big if, that he would convert back as a free will Christian, because that would be the only thing that would that would even remotely demand some sort of a judgment, much less an eternal bonfire, but just judgment in general. And so our free will is the only thing that that justifies any of this, or God, I would agree, would be immoral. Okay. So what when you say free will. I mean, we could talk about free will all day long and, and talk, we could both talk about free will and be talking about different things. And I, and I would suggest 
I mean, if you're saying that you, you, you used your free will to choose God or um, as Tom Talbot would put it, objective bliss, what is it about someone else's free will that has them choose hell, objective horror over bliss? And, and how could we call that person anything but a madman and not I mean, we would never call someone who thrusts themselves into the bonfire you're talking about as a free moral, as a free agent, as, I mean, <laughs> as, as someone who is free, we would say that person is enslaved by some sort of some trauma, some force, some delusion, some illusion, something. We would not say that person is free in the same way that I am free to choose the good or the blissful or the joyous. Right. I would argue, I would argue God has this sovereign will. He has an original will that, that man wouldn't have fallen. Then he has a ultimate will. So it's described like this. A guy told me one time, an evangelist, he says, imagine winter's coming. That's predestined. It's coming. You can't do anything to thwart it or stop it. My free choice in the matter is, is do I prepare? Do I buy gloves, boots, snow shovel, hat, or do I stand outside in the backyard butt naked and freeze to death? That's my choice. That's my free will choice. Now, that is what would be considered God's, God's permissive will inside his original will. If you look at God's will like a circle and you put original will at the top and you put ultimate will at the bottom, inside of that circle is, is God's permissive will that he sets boundaries on us as human beings because winter's coming. We can't deter that. His second coming is coming. We can't deter that. So our choices lie in do we prepare or not? Now, I would argue because some people want to put Satan's will on an equivalent with God's will, and I would argue that Satan has no will outside of God's will. So Satan's will is even subject to God. Read the first part of uh, the book of Job, you know, that you can do this, but you can't do that. You can, you can take everything he's got, but you can't take his life. So God was setting Satan's boundaries. If Satan was some independent will, he wouldn't have anybody setting his boundaries. Okay. Well, that doesn't answer my question on human volition. I mean, if you're saying that under, under your scenario here, you have winter is coming and you have two options to bundle up to, you know, to make sure you have firewood or to stand butt naked in the street and there's a blizzard coming, we can all see it, I would, I would simply suggest that the person is not free if they're standing out in the cold to freeze to death. There is something fundamentally psychologically wrong with the person who is making this so-called free choice. And it's, um, I, I could hardly call that free, just like I could hardly call the person if, to, to, who thrusts their face into a fire free. Well, listen, if we all go to Baskin Robbins, most people agree a choice is what flavor ice cream you want. But choice and free, choice and will are not synonyms. Well, I, I, a lot of people get hung up on the word will. Like somehow there's something that we can do to ultimately thwart God's will. That's what the Calvinist uh, uh, tulip predestination election argument they get all wrangled up about is somehow we can do something to thwart God's will. No, they, 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 they take it the other way. They say there's not anything that we can do to thwart God's will, and it's, and it's based on election alone. I mean, no, that's elect- right. I'm in agreement. If I, oh, if I stated that wrong, I agree with what you're oh. saying. Oh, so you're, you're more in the Calvinist camp. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just describing what the Calvinists think, but you more articulately described it than me. Okay, but, but so are you saying that through our free will, we choose God or we choose not God? So if, if I could be reductionistic and, and break your argument down. Well, that. we, we uh, Joshua says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Elijah says, how long falter ye between the two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. Right, so I'm, it, not, I'm not arguing that we can make choices. I, I agree with that, but I'm talking about human volition in a philosophical sense of, of, of would you say that you can freely choose objective horror to, to hell annihilation over, over objective bliss, which would be heaven, if you want to put it in that way? I don't know that most people make that free will choice on those terms. I would say they're blinded by something. They're blinded by... I, by... I, I agree. So 
so then my 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 next point would be then if they're blinded by something if they could see sin faith righteousness all those terms christians use if they could see those things for what it, they truly are would they not choose god every time if, if well, you could see clearly yeah you would think but the yeah. Jews, the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they stood right there. Christ told them, I'm the light of the world. They said, we can see perfectly fine. He says, I beg to pardon. You're blind as a bat. Go sell everything you have and buy some ISAB because I'm standing in front of you and you're getting ready to crucify me, basically. I paraphrase. Um, well, they what, said, God, they, could, they, God could excuse ignorance, but they were willfully saying, we can see and we can see perfectly. Now, you and I both know that, that they may be mentally deranged and may not be oh. seeing this decision in, in the clear light of day, but God says, for example, or Jesus said in the parable of the, the beggar man and, the, and the, the rich man and the poor beggar man, Lazarus, you know, if you would just, uh, you know, if you, if you would just send uh, them to my brothers and, and Christ says, if I raised one from the dead, which he did, Lazarus, you know, unless they believe Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't believe if I raised one from the dead. So that tells me right there that there are people, they may not be willfully choosing being dumped in, in, in judgment, but they're so oblivious to it, or they're so caught on their one way effort to their personal amusement, delight, satisfaction, whatever, that they're they're, they're just ignoring that ability to live eternal. I can't describe why they make that decision. I can't tell you with any authority why they make that decision. No more than I can tell you why Cain was born proud and stubborn and Abel was born meek and teachable. I can't nuance that out that far. All I can say is one was born one way, one was born the other, but they had the both the same, they was cut from the same cloth they was given the same opportunities, the same upbringing, the same education, the same treatment. Why one chose one way and why one chose the other, I can't, I can't nuance it out that fine. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I, and I can't either. I think there are a lot of factors that go that play into why people make choices. Um, that if you if you step back, you can see the detriment of their of their decisions, of their choices. Um, and and I'm I'm tracking with what you're saying. I I guess I'm just um I would like to think that God in all of God's infinite wisdom and sovereignty and all of that, whatever you want to say about those things, that God would give everyone the chance to see things truly and clearly for what they truly are, and designed us in such a way that we would always choose God. Now we can have the discussion on why people make horrible choices, why there's evil in the world. And, and I would just not say that someone will be eternally held accountable and, and annihilation or conditional immortality is an eternal choice. I mean, is, isn't it an eternal consequence in your view because they're eternally destroyed and, and those who go on or, or don't have their loved ones any longer. They, they have to press on without the people that they, that they loved, that they grew close with in life. Um, so it is an eternal choice of sorts. I, I would just say that I think God would would be able to to design us in such a way where if we are truly free, we'll always make that choice and that in the end, everyone will. I, I don't know why there would be a stipulation on it. Like all of a sudden, this is the end now and there's no more choices from here on on forward. Like that just seems really arbitrary and flippant. Well, let me throw a, a, a principle at you, and maybe the principle will explain itself or answer your question. Can love be true love? By definition, can love be true love if love can't be rejected? You're a married guy. I was a married guy. If you have a daughter, I've got a 40-year-old daughter. Right. My wife decided one day to walk away. Crush me, hurt me, broke my heart. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can't, it, it, I can't describe the pain that you go through in, in something like that. But if I could somehow force, coerce, manipulate, right. control, then it's not love. I agree. 
I agree. And God's whole basis of his whole universe is based on love. And, and only our volition, our free volunteer uh, response to that. It's like you initiate, I don't know, in your relationship, if your wife initiated you, you initiated your wife, but just say the way it normally works. A guy initiates towards a girl. Hey, you know, I like you and the girl's getting the vibes. This guy likes me. That kind of demands some sort of response. She's either going to have to signal, yeah, I, I'm, I'm receptive to those initiations or move on because I'm not interested. God always initiates towards us. We respond. And, and love just can't be love if love isn't rejected, uh, has the ability to be rejected. Right. So this is what I'm saying. This is at the whole crux of the Calvinistic Armenian debate is somehow that, you know, it, it's one of these things, just one of the tortured, one of the most tortured explanations that I had a Calvinist. I worked around several of them in a radio studio. Had a Calvinist uh, radio manager, uh, a couple of different producers. And this young producer's name was Ryan. And he said that God burning people in hell for an eternity is the ultimate demonstration of his love. Now, I don't know what kind of warped mental gymnastics and logic that is. And he was saying it all sincerity. And he was a really good kid. For an 18-year-old kid, he produced my show. He, you know, I, I pat him on the back. He a, was a, a good Christian man. But this is the kind of stuff he was raised into believing that somehow God's love is demonstrating, demonstrated in torturing someone. If someone was to kill somebody, and stab the body repeatedly after death, you'd say, that's a crime of, that's a crime of passion. That's a crime of vindictiveness. But yet we paint our loving God with these same characteristics of this overbearing, over tyrannical. Well, yeah, I agree. We're not, yeah, I, I agree with you on all that. Like I, I we can, we can sit here and kind of, <laughs> kind well, of but, 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 the, but if, if I'll just wrap it up for you, but, and good men and women believe that. I agree. But, yeah. but, but, but if you can't come to grips with the concept that man is not naturally immortal, that's going to lead you to the opposite error. That's what I told you right off the bat. Eternal torment, universalism, restoration, whatever you want to call it, it's two sides of the same coin. And both is equally it's really dangerous. Not. It's really, Be it's really not. That's, that, that's unfair because we're sitting here talking about a God who, who elects to torture people for all eternity versus, and, and, and I agree with you that that I re, I reject through my whole entire being. We're not talking about that. We're talking about God who restores everyone, and and there are many free will universalists. So to to talk about Calvinism, I mean to to sit here and 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 talk about Calvinism and then and then attach the universalism that I would affirm to the same coin is really quite unfair. Well, I've read a lot of Keith Giles articles, and I know that he has been all over the map. I think he started out with eternal torment. He, he grafted or moved towards annihilation, and he settled in on restoration, universalism, whatever you want to call it, and define yeah. it. That's great. Keith, Keith but, but, um, meta, metanoia means repent or change your mind. And Keith has changed his mind. And he talks about that a lot on our show, actually. But um, I mean, continue. But I, but I would use kind of a, a version of Pascal's wager. What if you're wrong? I mean, if I'm wrong, let's say I'm wrong and there is an eternal torment and I'm out there preaching there is no eternal torment. Well, so okay. what? I'm wrong. I'm, I mean, I'll burn yeah. with the other guys. Okay. Okay. So what if I'm wrong with universalism? Well, God's going to save everybody anyway. So I'm going to be saved anyway, even though I'm preaching against the doctrine. But what yeah. happens if the universalists are wrong? Then what happens if you're wrong in some other faith that believes that you're going to hell? I mean, you, you're assuming Pascal's wager presupposes whatever Pascal's faith is, which happens to be the Christian faith. I find Pascal's wager such a, um, such a like a cop out to where to where you're still presupposing you got the right god right because the muslim who believes in hell that you don't believe in he could simply say and not all muslims believe in hell i realize there are muslim universalists they're not a monolith just like christians aren't but a muslim who believes in hell can say what if you're wrong you're gonna go to hell well, we're all going to find out at some point but, well, I, but, I mean i guess so <laughs> but, but but i'm but i'm saying presupposing that I'm right, 
course. What do I got to, and I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just saying presupposing I'm right. Yeah. Um, if I'm wrong, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'm going to be in heaven anyway, if I'm wrong. But yeah. if, if the universalists, as you might describe, are wrong, then a whole bunch of people has went into the grave unprepared. They haven't repented. The Bible's full of these uh, opportunities, repent and be baptized, believe upon his name, thou shalt be saved. All these various invitations to mercy, but almost every invitation to mercy is accompanied with a following warning of judgment if that mercy is not heeded. So I would argue who has most to lose in a maybe a my own twist on Pascal's wager. Me, okay. go ahead. No, no, I, I see. I see your point, but okay. For one, I don't think life has to be like this high stakes game of the grandest kind in order for there to be meaning. Like we're talking about making a decision about something and 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 saying, oh well, it, we have to make a decision based on what are the consequences of it, and I, I think that's odd. Um, I also think that it's. There are many universalists, many, many, many universalists who preach repentance, who say there are consequences. There is hell. Like Robin Perry believes in hell. He's a universalist. There's a lot. Richard Murray, I think, believes in hell. As he argues, I, think, I, I don't remember. Um, oh, I just unplugged my headphones. Give me one second. Okay. So this is what happens. You know, I'm a, I'm a Sicilian, uh, you know, Sicilian heritage. We talk with our hands. Um, start pulling out my own headphones here. <laughs> um they just, they just, I don't remember Richard Murray's uh, specific, I know Richard, but I don't remember his specific um, uh, article that you referenced earlier, but if he's talking about the same early church universalists that I'm thinking of, they all believed in hell. They just believed that there was an end. So to say that, you know, we're, we're preaching mercy, maybe without repentance, without, without changing your mind is, is really a straw man. And it's kind of, um, we don't need to have that conversation because it's not what many believe. I mean, it, it would be like, you know, it's like you go, it, but there's a reason it's called the straw man because you can beat it before the battle. It's made of straw, but it's not the real thing. So there's really no point well, in having that discussion because I, I literally don't think, I don't, I can't think of one universalist who doesn't think there are consequences to your actions. Well, from what I've read of Keith's articles, that somehow now now the Catholic Church preaches purgatory, that right. it's not heaven, it's not hell, it's you know the poor peasant he unloads his pockets, you know to to get his dead loved one out of hell, out of torment, not quite in heaven but in purgatory. Okay, so if we agree that somehow man is in a conscious state after death, which would say that the day you eat of this fruit, you shall die. Well, what's dying? Is dying being in torment? Is, 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 is. Well, they didn't you know. die that day. So that we can't take that verse literally. They, I mean, well, they, did, they literally didn't die that day, according to the text. Well, I would argue had not the remedial animal sacrifice system been immediately instituted where the, the, the guilt of the person that had sinned, it was transferred onto the sacrifice, and that sacrifice obviously was a foreshadow of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God. Their faith in that made them righteous, as our faith in Christ's death, looking backwards, makes us righteous. They were looking forward to the cross. We're looking back the same event. But but I would I would ask, everybody knows torment. Everybody knows torture. You can torture somebody, and you can change behavior. But can you really change hearts and minds with torture? So I can say, hey, look, stop, stop. I, I, I cry, uncle, grace, I'll accept grace. I'll accept your, 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 your eternal life, Jesus. Just stop the torture. Have you really changed my heart and mind, or have you just changed my behavior? But no universalist is saying, I mean, no universalist that I know is saying that it's through torture that, <laughs> that someone comes to repentance. The, you know, the, the word um, Colossus in Greek, it's punishment or chastisement, it's discipline. Plato argued that um, there, that that word is for the benefit of the one being chastised. It's the way we chastise our children. We don't we don't beat them. We don't hit them with a switch or, or with a belt. We we discipline them. And as the writer of Hebrews says, 
Um, discipline in the moment, it does not feel good, but it's, it's for uh, someone's benefit. That is not at all to be thought synonymously with torture or torment or, or waterboarding or something yeah, like that. Yeah, okay, I, I'll agree with that. Uh, Charles Stanley put it uh, the best way I had ever heard. Uh, punishment is for the, uh, for the, sin, for the sinner. Um, discipline is for the saint. We discipline what we want close to us. What we love, we have to discipline. We want it near and dear to us. My dad used to work on these beautifully AAA figured gun stocks, this American walnut, an American French walnut, just beautiful feathered figures in them. And sometimes he'd work on something, it would get a flaw in it, and he wanted to deep six it. He didn't even want to look at it because it was so repulsive to him. That's what get that's what if 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 it was strictly punishment, God would want us so far out of his eyesight. It'd be unbelievable. But what he wants near and dear to him, he has to discipline. So I'm on board 100% with the discipline aspect. But I don't know, because, again, it may be some ignorance on my part, but I've read a lot of Keith's articles, and, you know, the best I can get out of them is somehow we're in this conscious state after death, where somehow the, 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 the bad branches are being burned off of us, and somehow we're going to get to the same point as the people who accepted Christ in this lifetime. Why, why does this life, why, okay, so why does this lifetime and the point of our death, why is that like some deciding factor for the God who is supposedly eternal and everlasting? Like, I, 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 I've because, always failed to understand that. It's like, Okay, so the person who lives to be 13 has oh, only so many chances, but the person who lives to be 110 has a lot more chances. But what's really important is the minute they take their final breath, they've secured through some blip in history, eternity, infinite. Like that to me, as, as I, I can't even wrap my mind around a billion, let alone infinite, because it's qualitatively so different. I don't understand why at... It's like, oh, you've got the age of accountability. I'm not sure what it is in Adventists, but I was always told 12. You turn into some 12-year-old kid, and now you're responsible for the infin infinite life that you are either going to have or not have. Well, I'm not I, sure what is so important about that. I, I would argue that this life is the only probationary period I believe the Bible teaches, that our decision has to be made in this life we're given. That's just my personal belief. So you have to you would have to say some people get more chances than the others. Uh, yeah, I guess you would say that. But God ultimately is the arbitrator and the ter determiner of those chances. And did they follow the light given? You see, I think this is where a lot of people get off off the rails. God can only hold you accountable for the light and the knowledge you've been given and the light and knowledge you've received. So I don't believe there's some blanket one-way ticket to heaven and some blanket one-way ticket to judgment it's based on an individual case what god knows that person was given what that person received what they done with the information they was given and the choices they made with it so, so what what is it what is it that gets you how do you know you're saved i mean assuming you think you are uh i well i've accepted jesus christ as my savior uh, i accept god's free grace that is justification. I'm headed towards glorification. And the process in between those two points is called sanctification. I'm being sanctified. I'm being disciplined. I'm being molded in God's oneness, his likeness, his image, his perfection. Okay. So and that's a, that's a process that the wicked aren't submitting to go through. But what I'm, about what about the non-wicked who haven't accepted Christ? What about the people who've never heard of Christ? What about the the Buddhist in, in, in Tibet who gives his life to, or her life to cultivating the earth and peace and, and meditation and contemplation who, who maybe have heard about some Jewish guy named Jesus who died a long time ago, but they don't accept Jesus that are, are you lumping them in with the, no. the so the so-called wicked no. and, and how would that person then be saved or they annihilated like the rest? Well, I believe there will be people in heaven that don't know the name of Jesus. 
they're there because of Jesus, because of his death. That's the only way to the father is through the son. He paved the, he built the infrastructure. He paved the way. I believe there'll be people in heaven who literally don't know his name because they kept the laws of nature. They, 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 they kept the light that they received. If they didn't receive light, God can't hold that against them in, in, in their judgment. But I would simply, I would simply argue or, or, or say, and not argue, but I would simply state that the sanctification process that we're going through is my free will to say, okay, I submit. You know, when I, when I was in, as I was telling you, my first principal in church school, Ed Rasasson, my grandma went out there and she said, well, now, Ed, uh, if, if, my, if Frank ever shows his butt, you can use the paddle on him. Now, I don't know that I appreciated that, but and I did get paddled one time, one swat in school. But, you know, what, what in essence sanctification is, is me submitting to the Holy Spirit saying, clean it out. Like the hoarders who's having the mental, emotional breakdown on the sidewalk. They're trying to clean this absolute crap out of his home because it's maybe feces, uh, mice, rats, whatever. And this person, maybe they're getting rid of a lampshade that has a urine stain on it that, her and their mom bought, and that person has a literal mental, emotional breakdown because you're going to throw that lampshade away. This is what the Holy Spirit's work is. Clean out the stuff that doesn't belong. Fill me with what needs to be filled with. Mold me in Christ's image, and I'm giving you my permission slip to do that. And if you got to turn my ass over and, and, and give me a swat on the butt, you got my permission because rather have a swat on the rear than not enter into the kingdom of God. So in essence, we are, we're may, we're going to be a servant to one or the other. We're going to be a servant to sin. We're going to be a servant to Christ. I'm just choosing my, I'm just choosing my, my, my master Christ and whatever he, yeah, and, and I, whatever I can... he has to do to mold me and fit me, you got my permission slip. And, and, and I, I respect that. I respect, I respect you saying that. I respect your choice in doing that. I, I, I guess I come back to the, what is so good about your free will that made you freely choose that? And why don't people who do choose that, why isn't their free will good enough? Because it, to me, it's like, it, it always, it, I've had to rethink the way I think of free will, um, especially working in social work and seeing kids who are abused and traumatized physically, emotionally, sexually, from the time that they're three, four, five, the, I mean, the, the horror, the, the, the horror I've read about, and then seeing it through a decade of work, I had to look at that and say, we cannot say that people just have this free will that we like to think about. I do believe that there is a free will of sorts, but I have to rethink of it. I, ha I have to rethink that because 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 of just the life circumstances and 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 the choices people make and and the enslavement you see of people and and I just I have to come back to the fact that if everyone could see the good the pure the the blissful the joyous god whatever we want to say love if people could see love through clear eyes without trauma without delusion they would always choose uh, the good and David Bentley Hart talks about this a lot in that all shall be saved and 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 in other places as well and and you know the people that I've read Tom Talbot and Rick Machuga my best friend's dad's have thought top philosophy for 34 years if we just re-understand free will through this this lens it would make so much more sense and 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 I just can't I can't go back to the fact that oh people just freely choose hell it's like no they don't just like just like someone doesn't freely choose to thrust their face into a fire we, well, we have to call that madness we have to call that something that is enslavement and, and and at the end of the day like everyone should be given if god is fair if god is just like christians want to talk about then then everyone has to have that 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 ability at some point to see it clearly and when they do how could i say they would choose anything but god well i would argue 
I would argue that God will take all those children that you've dealt with. I, he'll take their circumstances into, uh, into the total picture of their life. And as I said before, God's not going to hold something against somebody that they never had the ability to understand or receive. That's so, everyone who doesn't choose love, though. Yes, but can love be love if love can't be rejected? If if you told your wife, or if I told my wife, and I said, hey, look, uh, you're predestined to be my wife, and you got to love me no matter what, because it's preordained, it's predestined, a woman will show you how quickly that that is an error. If 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 you don't have the express purpose or the express ability to to embrace the love or walk away from the love, then that choice is meaningless. I, I agree with you. And, and, but I would retort and put it back on you and say, the only person who would not choose that love is the person who's enslaved. Because it presupposes to, you can have the ability to not choose that love. And we're talking about God. I mean, if someone doesn't choose my love, it doesn't mean they're enslaved. It means maybe I'm an asshole. Um, <laughs> but, it, but we're talking about God here. It, 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 the, the person who does not choose the love of God it's presupposed that they are enslaved by something there uh, by, by an, and it might not even be, maybe, maybe not even slaves the right word, but an ignorance of some sort, they're not seeing um, the love of God for what it truly is. And any choice to not choose the good or the God or the bliss, it presupposes something that is other than freedom. Well, if we argue that, for the sake of argument that Lucifer existed and is the fallen angel, Satan, the dragon, the serpent of old, he had that same opportunity. Now, what it was the, the poet Milton said something to the effect, I'd rather, I'd rather reign on earth than serve in heaven. You know, God came to be a servant. Christ sought to be a king, sought to, self, set, sought to set himself oh, above the most I high. I don't so I, think Jesus came to be a king. When every no, any anytime they wanted to make Jesus king, he 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 bounced. He went to the wilderness. Came to serve. If I right. If, oh right 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 okay. If if I if I said king, I right. I, I that's not what I meant. But let me define one term here. I don't know how long we'll go on, but let me define one term here that I would simply. I don't argue instant annihilation, as some people would argue annihilation. I believe there's going to be a fire. I believe that judgment that all will be brought into judgment. It'll be part of the punishment process. But according to Malachi 4, we walk on the ashes of the wicked, not hot coals. At some point, that fire will go out. When God formed Adam from the, from the clay of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul. So air in, life, air out, death. And so I would argue, or I would debate, uh, uh, that... Uh, before man existed, before Adam and Eve existed, they were in a state of non-existence. And I would simply say that when man goes back, the wicked are judged, every knee bows, every mouth confesses, and, and, and they go back into a state of non-existence. Now, I don't call that instant annihilation because I believe there is going to be some punishment involved in this process, but it's not going to be ongoing and eternal and forever. And as I said, we both agree that that is just a revolting notion. It's absolutely sickening, revolting notion. And it's chasing more people into the arms of atheism than it, you know, draws towards God. Yeah, that, that's why I was a little put off by the, by the, by the attaching my view or the view of a universalist to the Calvinist coin of eternal torment, um, because that's not what this is. Um, let me ask you this. So if you if you don't believe that it's instant annihilation, what is the purpose of that punishment then, however the duration is? And and it, it, and and it, correct me if I'm wrong. You you mentioned that every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord, but doesn't does Paul not say that no one can do that except through the Holy Spirit? And at that point, what does God do with that confession or that? I mean, in the Greek, the, the implication is not simply confession, but it means to give praise through and through, to, to like freely do it. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it an act of praise. I'm just simply saying that they will bow their knee because they will acknowledge that God is sovereign, 
that they, they have been shown the errors of their way. They see their wickedness. They see they've made their bed with Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan. They know that. Let me throw an ironic twist at you. Well, can I just can I just you can do that in one second. Can I just yeah, go mention ahead. that in the text? That's what it says. OK, I, 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 I hear you. Okay. But I would describe eternal torment as a as a as a wicked person being in heaven finding no joy, finding no one to tempt, finding no one to hurt, standing in the, in the brilliance and the glory of God, that indeed would be eternal torment. Because the Bible talks about that when Christ's second coming, that God's brightness will be so brilliant, his glory so great that they will cry for the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them, to shield them from the glory of God. And so I would simply say torment would be forcing the wicked to be in the presence of God when they really don't want to be. And sad to say as it is, sad to say as it is, and I hear you because you're, you're, you're a thoughtful guy. You're a caring guy. Oh, don't patronize. Can, Please don't patronize no, me. No, but I, I, seriously, you're a thoughtful, caring guy. And you know, and I can hear it in your voice, that, that, that God has pleaded and give every opportunity to these people. And if they don't have the simple ability to just say, no, thank you, I don't want any part of it, then you can't call God's love, love. It's well, something I, else. I don't, I don't like that we're talking about, quote, unquote, these people, because, I mean, often, like, if we look at, if we're honest, so this is a problem that I have with much of Christianity is that, uh, especially the people that, that basically end up with a binary of the saved and the lost or the, 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 the elect and the non-elect, however you want to slice it, is it's always those people that don't make it. It's never us people. And we can talk about how we're, we're not perfect and we're, we're being sanctified and, and, and yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, it, it gets us to a place where the wicked are them and the righteous are us. And I really don't, I, I don't like that language. Um, I, I, it's done a lot more harm than good. Um, and, 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 and I, and I, but, but going back to going back to the text that, that, that Paul, when Paul talks about every knee bowing and every tongue confessing Jesus is Lord, he says that no one can do this except through the Holy spirit. And the, the, the word he uses that is not simply confession. Like you would confess Caesar is Lord through compulsion and coercion, which we agree upon like that would be, that wouldn't be love at that point. But well, what Paul, what Paul is talking about in, in Romans and, and another place, I think maybe Philippians or Ephesians, not that he necessarily wrote, but whatever, um, that, that it's, it's through the whole of their being, they are giving praise that Jesus is Lord. They are thankful. That's not, they're not bowing under compulsion. They're, they're bowing like in a, in an act of praise. And, and I just, I can't help but wonder, and no Christian denies that, 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 everyone will bow to, to, you know, to Jesus and, and confess that Jesus is Lord because it's in the text. I just wonder what does God do with that then? Does he say, nope, sorry, snuffed. Like it's not good enough. It's too late. Um, I just needed that. I, I, I'm very capricious and I, I just needed that to stroke my ego and now go, go be gone with you. I'm going to go hang out with my people and these people, the wicked can go. Well, when not I talk, go, not go to hell, but go to annihilate. Go, when I be annihilated. When I talk about the wicked, I'm not I'm not putting anybody arbitrarily there. So I'm not placing anybody there. When I just say wicked, I mean wicked in general. Righteous wicked is just in who's lost and who is ultimately saved in God's foreknowledge. So I'm not placing anyone there arbitrarily. Well, but, it may not be arbitrary, but but we can't help but when we categorize people as that, we can't help but then see who are the righteous and who are the wicked. I mean, it's the it's the incarcerated who's the wicked. Maybe it's the person who's a lot of people like to pick on the gay people or the bi people or the trans people. They're the wicked. Or for different groups, it's it's um, maybe it's Muslims, maybe it's atheists, maybe it's agnostic, maybe it's Jews who haven't focused. I mean, we we always categorize, and depending on different groups that have the classification of the wicked or the lost or the damned. But we, I don't. I don't know anybody's heart. God knows their heart. So, for example, if I walked into heaven and John Wayne Gacy or 
Jeff Dahmer or Ted Bundy or any of those guys were there. And they, and, and I knew for a fact that God demonstrated that they accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. And just so happens if my son or daughter happened to have been one of the victims and my son or daughter wasn't there, I'm going to have to be happy with who's there or who's not there because God has made that determination that in his foreknowledge, this person accepted, this person repented, and had this person lived, would not have repented. So I can be comfortable with whoever is there. So this earthly life has no bearing, and whatever crime somebody committed on this earthly life has no bearing with their eternal life, because the thief that was next to Christ said, when thou come in thy kingdom, remember me. See, that's where you lose me in, in saying that it has no bearing. I mean, a lot of times universalists are accused of, of, of this life not having any meaning. Oh, because in the end, everyone gets saved. What's the point in anything we do? And now you're saying that the, our life choices have no bearing. And, and I, 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 that you lost me on that. They, they have bearing on our earthly life. I mean, our life choices, if I stick my hand in, in, a, in a fan, I get it cut off. That's a, that's a consequence that God can forgive the sin, but he can't always forgive the consequences because it's natural cause and effect. But my earthly life, if I ask forgiveness and I truly repent and God abides in me and I abide in Christ, see, this is where we get into this idea that Satan believes in God. Satan knows who God is, but does God abide in him? Does, does Satan abide in Christ? And I would say uh, that well, again, while I'm, a, wh while I'm a, not to judge, I'm allowed to be a fruit inspector. I may know them by their fruits. So based on the fruits of the tree, there's no abiding going on between the two of them. So just merely having superficial knowledge of someone doesn't mean that I'm living in that person, in that close-knit relationship that it takes to be saved. So I would argue as the thief on the cross instantly repented and he didn't instantly go to heaven i believe he's in the grave with everybody else waiting for resurrection to life because it depends on where the comma is placed before the day before the word today or after the word today because you could read it two different ways verily verily i say to you today you will be with me in paradise that's one way that makes you think that the thief went immediately to heaven but if there was no punctuation in the original Greek. So if you put the comma before the word today, you got verily, verily, I say to thee today as a proclamation, thou shalt be with me in paradise. So that thief, one thief on one side of him rejected Christ clearly. One thief on the other side of him embraced Christ. And I expect to see one in the kingdom of God and the other I you know, I'm not saying because I'm not going to judge because that's not my duty to judge somebody. But if he's not there, it wouldn't shock me. So I'm just saying that our life, this life is the probation period that God has granted us. And whatever decision making we do, we need to do it in this lifetime while we are, we, while we're conscious, while we're young, while we have an ability to make decisions. And then maybe some people on their deathbed, like the thief on the cross, made a decision for the Lord, and I think he's going to be in heaven in the kingdom. Yeah, and okay, that's, I mean, that's, that's your belief. I, I, I respect your belief. I, 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 I'll, I'll go back to the fact that it all seems quite arbitrary. I mean, it, you know, you could have, you could have someone who was an atheist, lived a great life, loved their family, loved others, helped the poor, did all the things in Matthew 25, um, who doesn't accept Jesus, who is not going to live forever in heaven. And, I, then you, and then you could have, you could have, uh, you know, the, the, the person who lived a terrible life <laughs> was, a, was a, an abuser, was a murderer, and he could just repent at the end of his life. And uh, it's all, it's all, it's all good. And, and to me, that just, that comes back to some of the, I mean, talk about talk about creating atheists i mean that that whole narrative it just seems has been like done and overdone and seems really arbitrary and the, and it almost makes god kind of flippant and and capricious i i i would disagree just knowing that that god is sovereign god has knowledge of hearts and minds which i don't he knows the decisions that we would make if we were had our full uh, capabilities. 
And would we, again, would we all with our full capabilities not always choose God? Well, Lucifer apparently had his full capabilities, his, his full capacity, and he made a conscious choice apparently to, to be, let me get close to the microphone here. He made a conscious choice apparently to uh, rather reign on earth as number one than to serve in heaven. Well, so I, again, I, again, if, 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 I, if I accept the premise, I wouldn't accept the premise that Lucifer was Satan, but if I accepted the premise that Satan existed, I would say he didn't have the capacity because he didn't have the full capacity because it was power that enslaved him. It was his desire for power. So again, like it is always presupposed by some sort of enslavement. And, and so you could say, oh, he had the full capacity, but I'm like, what, wait, no, it was his desire to reign. What is that? A desire for power. That seems to be a great enslavement of all of us. Like the, you know, the, the Lord Acton saying power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I mean, so it was already corrupted. By power. I, won't, I won't argue that it's, it's not, it's not a delusional thinking on their part. But, and again, I, I can't give you the answer as to why uh, his, his thinking went sideways and went delusional. Yeah, but, but I'm saying, uh, but, but my question would be, without that delusional desire for power, would someone with the full capacity not always choose God? Well, it would be the argument is a, is a let's see, how is it phrased, is someone who doesn't accept Jesus mentally ill, something to no, that effect. Of course not. Well, but in, in some ways, that's what you're saying. If they had their full... I'm not saying mentally ill, because I, I, I wouldn't use that language. Well, uh, well, you know, maybe an inartful choice of terminology, yeah. but are they somehow off somehow because they're not accepting? If they had their full capabilities, why wouldn't they accept this gift? Well, what else would, would determine that they wouldn't accept it. It would have to be some sort of yeah, delusion, I'm, derangement, something. I'm, I'm saying that I'm, I'm saying the true freed human being or free human being would not reject the love of God and that any rejection of the love of God, even if you can make that rejection, it would presuppose an enslavement, a delusion or ignorance of some sort. But with, with, our free ability, our free volition to love, there has to be that choice and that decision making, or it's, you know, I don't know but, if it was, I don't know if it was your article or Keith's article, because I get some of these articles confused, but one of them made the statement. Well, if it was well written, it was Keith's. If it was just <laughs> thoughts thrown down, it was probably mine. Well, maybe you'll remember the statement. Something to the effect, I argue that. There cannot possibly be faith without the ability to doubt. And I think this is where so many modern apologists go off the rails is when they somehow try to prove God 100%, you can't deny whatever. Without the ability to, to doubt, there can't possibly be faith. In either you or Keith's article, one of you said something to the effect that the opposite of, of faith is not doubt, but certainty. Yeah, it could have been either Keith or myself. We probably okay. both said that. Yeah. Okay. So I would I would argue that 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 God is never going to eliminate doubt because you could say, hey, look, here's a perfect environment. Adam and Eve is created. Eat of this tree of life. The day you eat, you shall surely die. No further explanation. So he didn't remove and eliminate all ability to doubt. Now. Some people would have to suspend their critical thinking. Some people would say, hey, I can't go based on that flimsy set of facts. I need more facts to this to make a, a, a determinative decision. I can't just go on them skimpy uh, little facts. But that's the choice that he gave. Eat of this tree and live. Eat of this tree and die. Now, whether you want to argue that they died that day spiritually or not, I would argue that you know, a, a remedial animal sacrifice system came into play immediately to where the sins was transferred onto the animal to substitute offering. But I would, but I would simply argue that, um, you know, if we don't have this 
ability to choose, to love him in response, then that love is meaningless. He might as well program us as robots to serve him. You know, I listen. Well, when I, that's a, that, that to me is like, it's you're taking the binary, like Calvinist or Pelagian or Arminian. And, and I'm just saying there's a, there's a middle way. And when your daughter, and I have a daughter, so when your daughter curls up on your lap and she gives you the oh, most- She's almost a teenager. She don't do that. Okay, anymore. well, if she- <laughs> Clum up on your lap and give you a big kiss and a hug and say, Dad, I love you. Is Can money buy that? No. It's from there. It, if you could manipulate or control that or coerce that in any way, it would be meaningless. Right. But on the flip side, there's nothing she could do on, on the opposite side of that would, that would make me ever stop loving her. Well, yeah, I won't argue that. And well, God doesn't... Can, does God, God does, love those who are who are not don't exist any longer? How can God yes. love that which doesn't exist? He loves them still. God loves Lucifer. God loves the fallen angels. God loves the wicked, but He loves them enough that so, if he, they, so He will love them beyond their own destruction. No, He can't love them beyond their own destruction because so, God, so God's love is limited. I mean, God God will stop loving. Well, those, that that's are, that's the ultimate argument. I end up with. Can God create a rock big enough he can't pick up? No, that's not the same. That's not the same because can God because set, that's a that's a theoretical. These people existed. Can God set boundaries? Can God set a boundary that he himself won't cross and infringe upon? So if you're a big six foot five guy and you're married to some little petite woman, you got a little petite kid, you got some dogs, you could come home, punch your wife, kick your dog, abuse your kids. Because you're big enough and you're tough enough to do it. But you set yourself a boundary that there's something that I'm not going to cross in this relationship. And even a God being sovereign is not going to cross this boundary into our free will to reciprocate that love that he initiates towards us. Well, um, except, except the passage that says the sun sets people free, but... Um... I think we could go on for a long time. Do you have yeah. like maybe like a two minute wrap up and then I'll do a two minute wrap up and then um, and then we'll be out of here and I'll I'll take care of the questions on Facebook for those who are listening. I will make sure I'll go in there and um, Frank, I'll send you a link and you can comment okay. if you'd like. Well, yeah, I would just, you know, I use this analogy because once upon a time I was a fisherman. Uh, if I got a three way hook and I'm out to catch a fish, I don't care which of the three barbs it gets hooked on. One barb is as good as the other. So I would argue, I mean, you could go into the uh, theological trilemma of uh, conditionalism, uh, soul immortality, and restitution or reconciliation, go into all kinds of things. But I, I would simply argue that, that, that it's the same side of, it's the two sides of the same coin, and both are air. And I think both are going to lead to... Um, destruction and i just that's my basic argument that we that our that our probationary period is on this life right now and we need to make our decision for the lord today because he says when i come knocking you know your day of salvation is today accept me today there is no tomorrow and and that our fates are sealed upon our death that's why the Bible says don't get caught like a thief in the night. That's not a, uh, a secret rapture, a rapture of any, of any sort. Just uh, make your decision now. That'd be my basic argument. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I will say that there was a lot of talk about Adam and what Adam did. And uh, so I love what the Apostle Paul does in uh, 1 Corinthians when he talks about what was done in Adam is undone in Christ. The sin of Adam led to death, but how much more the life for the same all that sin led to um, in Christ. So um, if we assume that all are under the uh, sin and death from Adam, then um, as I talk about in some of my books, um, the all in the second clause is as uh, all means all. So um, that, that would be, uh, I don't necessarily base my universalism on the apostle paul but i i do think paul was a universalist and um i will say uh, again like 
I think anyone truly free would only choose God. And, and that, that would be kind of my philosophical argument there. And, but again, Frank, thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for everyone listening. Um, I will get to your questions and comments on Facebook thank, live. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate yeah. you setting this up. Enjoy the sure. conversation. Um, right. Very, very civil and very good conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. All right. Good night, everyone. You too.